Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range forecast video brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. We're going to begin first by taking a look at a couple of maps here, uh, kind of rewinding the clock back to September. These data were just released by the National Center for Environmental Prediction and show that in terms of average temperature, um, uh, September 2019 ranks as the second warmest on record across the United States. And a lot of that was due to very warm overnight low temperatures, which is now the warmest in terms of those minimum temperature ranks for the month of September. And our records, again, go back 125 years. But some of us across the country are, are seeing this map and going, what are you talking about? Well, what carried us was much of the south, the mid-south, getting up into parts of the Corn Belt, this region and through here. You remember that a lot of time throughout the month of September, we saw ridging that happened either here or happened here. Uh, and under those ridges, we saw some very, very warm conditions at time. Well, as those ridges built in, the west coast of the United States certainly dipped into troughs. And as a consequence, that's where we see our below normal temperatures. In terms of precipitation, there is quite a bit of extremes on this map. When you look down there in the southeast and parts of the mid-south, we see that uh, from Virginia over to Tennessee, second driest, but parts of West Virginia, Kentucky, then going from Mississippi to Alabama, Georgia, and down to Florida, driest on record for, for September. Uh, in the north central plains in the northwest, the almost the exact opposite. Um, North Dakota, by the way, having its wettest September on record. And when you break this down county by county or division by division, we see that even some of the places that were showing some higher numbers, like parts of Texas and the Carolinas, well, that was partly because of uh, Dorian and Imelda, those two tropical systems that came through. So when we think about the context of this video, I want to be thinking about three regions, specifically the West Coast United States, the Central United States, and the Southeast. What are we anticipating in terms of changes there? Well, in the near term, a lot of the focus is going going to be uh, in, in the north central plains of the United States. We're watching three areas where the surface wind field as we move in to the day on Thursday is going to be telling us what's going on. Big coastal low sitting here. This actually was a transition of a tropical system over to an extra tropical system, bringing some very strong winds. The development of our next big low pressure system right here that's going to be eventually moving into parts of, of Minnesota throughout the day on Thursday. That is going to be a powerhouse of an early season winter storm. And of course, we're still dealing with the super low relative humidities combined with the Santa Ana winds increasing fire risk across California. So these are the things we're watching in the near term and uh, thinking about it, this is our all hazards weather map from early in the morning uh, here, or mid morning I should say, on Wednesday. And uh, we can see that uh, we've expanded the region where we have our frost and freeze warnings. Also they align here, part of the Willamette Valley. And you can see the expansive area of winter storm watches, winter storm advisories, and winter storm warnings. And this is going to continue to expand to the east with time. So we need to talk about this system before we get into the long range forecast. Some of the tricky parts of this system are happening uh, through throughout the day tomorrow, getting into uh, tomorrow night and then Friday morning. Specifically, as we bring in all this warm air out ahead of this system, a lot of rain out ahead of it, but then we see the pinks that are in here, there will be a transition briefly to some sleet and freezing rain before everything goes over to snow. You can see the north-south orientation of this storm track and the heavy snow, which is indicative of its uh, basically the orientation of the upper level trough. And as the south side of this sees a front that passes through that we do have to watch out in the day on Thursday for this region in here to briefly see a chance for some severe weather. You can see the, the strong to severe storms that may show up there. And it's reflected well by looking at the all hazards weather map for Thursday, excuse me, the uh, Storm Prediction Center uh, um, uh, convective outlook for day two. So we're watching a pretty broad area in here for uh, the potential for some of these thunderstorms to be quite strong as they move to the south of this low pressure system. But I think much of the national attention is on snow right now. So this is the probability of picking up at least a foot of snowfall. And we see here that parts of the Dakotas and Minnesota getting up into Manitoba and over into Ontario, there is a, an extremely high probability of seeing that much snow. So we might as well go ahead and look at some of the snow maps to see the placement, but also see some of the values. We can see here from the operational GFS model, that same corridor getting lit up here with quite a bit of heavy snow. Some of these amounts getting well over the 18 to 24 inch range. The European model picks up on the same thing. It's that same corridor, a little bit different map projection, but it's the same corridor 
seen some of the heaviest snows here. And I kind of call this Mitchell here on straight north here uh, is gonna I think gonna be our heaviest corridor uh, into that particular area. And even the National Digital Forecast Database, so this is what the National Weather Service will be putting out. It's amazing to see these numbers from the 15 to 30 inch range in through here. And of course, this, there's not a hard stop on the border. This extends into Manitoba and parts of Saskatchewan and over in Ontario, but this is just a, a, a US map. So uh, the potential is there. And why the potential is there, look at this, right in through here, this is a map showing precipitable water. And over a six hour time period, we're not having any trouble bringing in a nose of at least one inch of liquid equivalent. So uh, this means that in this particular corridor, as that moisture comes wrapping around the backside, we'll have multiple hours over which we're putting high moisture content air, and as a result, to see the liquid water amounts out of this system ranging from an inch and a half to three inches is why we're able to see such high snowfall amounts. We may be biasing them a bit high by using a 10 to one snow ratio. That's for every, um, you know, it looks like this, or every one inch of, of liquid equipment get 10 inches of snow. Maybe a better rate would be eight to one, or maybe even seven to one given that it's uh, this time of year in October and this has so much warm moist air out ahead of it. But still this is a very big snowfall event. My greatest concern with it is going to be that as the storm system moves through, this is valid 4 p.m. on Friday, and the low stalls right here as the system becomes cut off and vertically stacked is that we will sustain strong winds within this quarter right in through here for several hours. And uh, as a consequence of that, putting a wet snow on top of a crop that still needs to be harvested and then blasting it with 20 to 30 mile an hour winds that occasionally gust to 50 uh, in parts of the Dakotas and we're, we're spelling out a disaster here for, for farmers in that area. To show you what the temperatures are doing, I put a hard contour, a black line at 32 degrees. So this is from the National Digital Forecast Database looking for Saturday morning's low temperatures. This is going to be, I think, our coldest morning that we're gonna have out of this system. So you can see everywhere across the country that is gonna be near freezing. Remember, even these places where you see these low 30s into this area, uh, we have to watch out for patchy frost in those regions as well, especially in low-lying areas. This is from the National Blended Model, so I'm showing you multiple sources here. Again, picking up on that same corridor. About the only difference I could find was in uh, the early morning GFS model run. It wanted to wrap this system up a little bit tighter, bring the winds around more from the west. So you can see it's pushing the colder air farther into Illinois and Wisconsin rather than letting it dig down into parts of Kansas. But regardless, uh, this is going to be bringing a, a stoppage to much of our growing season in the midsection of the United States. So putting that all together and now stretching this out into the longer term over the next five days, we are once again off my color bar in terms of temperature anomalies. And when I created this, I did this in a way that I thought we wouldn't it'd be very infrequent that we would get off the, the color bar range here. But uh, that deep trough that's sweeping through is certainly doing its best to bring in quite a bit of cold air on the backside. Day six through 10, as this upper level trough migrates over the Great Lakes into the north and east, turns out this particular pattern is a bit of a drier one for those folks that just got hammered in here as we slowly kind of let the whole system reset itself. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but it's certainly showing the colder weather getting through the eastern Corn Belt and up into the northeast. But what I really want you to hone in on is day 11 through 15, all right? We start to see the colder air rebuilding back here to the west and the warmer air kind of occupying parts of the southeast. And that means that um, this whole pattern that we've been in seems to want to go right back into its original configuration here. So I want to talk to you about some of my forecasts. I went back and watched all my forecast videos from the month of September, and every time I talked about October, um, I look back and I see that my, my failure rate was pretty high. I had a couple of problems. I was relying too much on model output, and I was not fully understanding, I'll skip to bullet point number three, fully understanding the way some of the teleconnections were changing. Uh, to see this really powerful, strongly positive Indian Ocean dipole event, uh, initially it just confused me. I hadn't seen one quite that strong in a while, and I took me a while to catch up to it. I'll tell you this as well. My mid-month, I had called for a while for the mid-month of October to maybe calm down a bit. And that forecast probably would have been valid, save the fact that uh, Super Typhoon Hagibus is coming. And you're gonna see what that's gonna do here in a few minutes. But to be honest with you, my, my forecasting colleagues who went with a persistence forecast, uh, that, was, um, that was the call. That was the right call to make with this pattern, just like it was back in spring. 
When you look over there on the right, that's just the last week or so of precipitation anomalies. And the problem is the system that is coming through is basically coming right back through this same corridor, putting down more rainfall. We did get some meaningful rainfall coming through the Mid-South, through the Appalachian Mountains, but there are still places in the Southeast and in Texas that have not seen rain in over 45 days. Now, I want to come back to this idea of what we expect to see here transitioning in the parts of the country that were very wet. So let's talk about the midsection of the U.S. getting into the primary corn belt. First, some longer-term trends. Over the last 70 years, uh, we brought this up a couple weeks ago, but we have basically increased. This blue line is the trend. We've increased about a third of an inch. That's about a 10% increase in rainfall in the month of October. That's just been kind of systematic over the last 70 years or so. So I wanted to find what could really make a wet October and let's see how these things are evolving. So the years that I pointed to with an arrow there, that's our top 10, 11 years of wettest Octobers across the primary corn and soybean belt. And it's this time of year that we really pay attention to the interaction between the tropics and the extra tropics and what it does to the jet stream. Now, this is where things get really interesting, okay? In those years, our wettest Octobers here, okay, those years typically had negative velocity potentials in this area and negative velocity potentials in this area with positives all around them. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you have a negative velocity potential here, the air is generally rising, and there's a lot of wet weather there. And then where you see the blues over here, there's a lot of wet weather. Where the warmer colors are, that's where the atmosphere is suppressing convection, and therefore it is drier. Now, you know, when I was analyzing this a month ago, I said, well, if we end up getting that pattern, well, that would point to a very wet October, and we weren't forecast to get that pattern. Because the weather forecast models back in September, well, look, do you see the positive numbers here? That would indicate areas, in fact, it's continuing, where we would expect over Australia and Indonesia to be in the opposite phase of something that would get us a really, really wet October. So I use that plus sea surface temperatures plus a few other things, including the condition of El Nino, to say that I didn't think that October was going to be one of our top 10 wettest. But the way that these things have come together has changed that up. This is what I mean. Still, over the next 15 days, look, this particular region is showing up dry. So why is my forecast busting? Well, a lot of it has to do with what you see right here. That, over the next several days, is the impact of that super typhoon. Now, can you see this pattern with me? Right in through there, the typhoon gets absorbed into a trough. Then you see this same region wet, slamming into the west coast of Canada. And then you see this region is wet as well. You're seeing a progression of troughs that begin here, move here, sweep across the western United States, and set up shop in the midsection of the country. And that progression of, of patterns, well, if, if we could have stopped, I think, the typhoon, we would have gone into a drier mid-month, and we would have seen a lot of folks get a lot of harvest uh, going here. But instead, we don't. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. This is an animation of upper level uh, winds, and um, excuse me, upper level heights. So we're looking at the thickness of the atmosphere, so troughs and ridges. You see this over here? This is Saturday. That is the typhoon as it goes over Japan. Now, our trough here moves out. And as it moves out, it would get us into a drier pattern after this. But that typhoon has now been sucked into this broader trough feature here sitting off the Aleutian Islands. And what do we know from history? If there is a big trough here, well, look at our wettest Octobers. They tended to feature a trough or a jet stream pattern that was initiated right there off the Aleutian Islands. So we can see it. Now, let's remove the drawings and see where things go. The leftover energy, if you want to call it that, from Typhoon Hagibis is now responsible for the production of this trough. And we're going to watch to see that trough then eventually get right back into the west. And it looks as though by the time we get to the 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, that time period, the position of this trough is once again going to make the midsection of the United States very active again. So our wettest Octobers in the midsection of the country feature troughs in these places in a ridge over the southeast. And what do we see? We can see here by looking that we did have a trough, another one even established there, trough in the west and a ridge over the southeast. 
which means this pattern, which is largely unblocked and moving, is going to continue to cause problems. We're going to get some near-term reprieve, but overall not much. That reprieve before that typhoon messes with everything is seen right here. This is looking at the day 4 through 10 precipitation anomalies. So in other words, what we're looking at here is after this big winter storm goes through, what do we get after that? We see overall a drier pattern, but you can see what's coming into the west coast. That's not only in the GFS, but it is also in the European Ensemble, drier in this area. Now, if you're in parts of the southeast and the mid-south down here, both models want a lingering front in that area early in this time period, bringing some nice rain, rain that's needed. Yes, it will interrupt harvest, but it's rain that is needed. But look at what happens by the time we get into the full week two pattern. So this is week two only from the GFS and week two only from the ECMWF. And the models are taking us right back over to that wetter pattern. So that is what's going on in the near term. And uh, that is the influence of a typhoon on the flow of our weather 15 days later. It's amazing to see how connected this all is. Let's do a quick check-in on what our global teleconnections are doing as we stretch this out to the week three and week four forecast. Our Indian Ocean Dipole, IOD, is right now at historic highs. And because of that, see all the cool water in here and the warm water here? That's a lot of thunderstorms where I just put this X and it is very dry right in through this area. This is causing a wind to come out of the east and blow wet, uh, to the west across the open Indian Ocean. And another wind here heading back east that's bringing the water temperatures in this area up. And that is why we've seen over the last few weeks a warm up in El Nino region 3.4. Now if that particular pattern continues, we slide into what's called a Madoki or Modokai El Nino. That's where it's cool here and warm in this area. And that paints a very tricky forecast picture moving forward. So knowing that's what our teleconnections are doing, and by the way, uh, in addition to El Nino, the Indian Ocean Dipole, the Mad Julian Oscillation is attempting to get out of phase one, although I don't know if it'll be able to do it. Secondly, we still have low global angular momentum. And when we put all those things together, we need to focus on, I think, what the pattern's gonna end up doing because of them. So what we're gonna now look at is week three only. So this is October 23rd through the 30th. We do see a drier time period in the Northwest, but the European Ensemble paints this area wet, here wet, and here wet as well. What about the US equivalent? That would be the CFS model. It also has a wet condition, kind of wetter conditions here and wetter conditions down in the Caribbean. So some similarities between the models. The CFS is also more aggressive with being wet through the Appalachian Mountains coming back into parts of the South. That's week three. But a good thing to do when we're looking specifically at model output is to see the trend. So when you look at this, this up here, which I just put a star in, is the most recent run. And the runs get older as you go like this across the screen. So the newest run is up here where the star is. I'll put a circle in the oldest run down there at the bottom. So these are the last six runs of the European model looking specifically at the 23rd of October through the 30th. I see some things that are quite robust. Dry, 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 dry. See that? I also see that the wetter path in through here keeps showing up in almost all of these model runs. And it's more prominent in the three most recent runs than it was the three previous. So that's a model trend we can't ignore. What about our temperature patterns? Well, this is what they look like. You can see that, again, here's the newest. I'll put a star on it. Here's the oldest. I'll put a circle. We see that pretty consistently painted picture where there's going to be some sort of a trough feature sitting in the western United States. And as long as that's there, this corridor right in through here, I'll just draw lines through it, tends to stay wet. So there's some support in our long range models as to whether or not this is going to happen. What is going to be tough is looking out to week four because this is where things get kind of crazy. Again, newest run, oldest run. Now in the last two two model runs for week four in the forecast. So this is the first week of September. Look at how wet the previous run is and how not wet this one is. What I'm trying to tell you is not only is this problem happening in the ECMWF, but it's also happening in the CFS model. It's happening in several others. And therefore, right now, living outside of that three-week window is going to be very challenging as we move into the month of November. But I do want to show you one last thing as we wrap this up. Looking at temperatures, we see the same temperature pattern hanging on. And if that same temperature pattern tends to hang on, we'll look at what November and December precipitation anomalies look like. So this is November forecast by the European Ensemble, and this is December. And what we don't see on this map are a lot of these colors, the drier colors. 
And therefore, I think as we slide in through the month of November and then into December, things are going to stay pretty active across much of the United States in terms of our precipitation patterns. And I know that is something that a lot of you watching the video do not want to hear. But this is the best guidance that I have at this point. But that's also why we update the weather forecast every day so that we can see how these things evolve. I hope you found this informative and useful. But with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up right here. We Train, thank you for watching. Hope you look forward to all of our content coming out this week. Thank you.